There's a good chance, a lot of what I'm going to tell you in the 55 minutes I have, you've heard before. Some of you are very involved in education, you go, uh, go to a lot of courses. I know every day I get, I don't know, half a dozen emails from organizations that are going to help me solve my soft skill problems. You know, how to be a better administrative assistant, how to solve my supervisor leadership skills, how to solve my toxic workplace issues. Some of them I do. They're my emails, I see that. But the question is, how do we know which is the best one? How do we know it's going to work? And where are we going to get the time to do it all? Maybe it's too much information. The question is, how do we decide what we want to do? So I want to talk about how do we look at that. So just talking about last night, two of our presenters talked about uh, fractured communication. And one of the conclusions they had was that maybe there's too much information out there. Would you agree? Yeah, so the question is, what's best for us? How do we get better? So while the title is The Totally Organized Profession is All About Outcomes, what it's really saying is, what do we accomplish as a result of the effort we spend? So my goal in this 54 minutes is to be a little more inspirational, uh, to uh, inspire you to do things where it comes to that. But since we're in Africa, I thought I'd just show this one as well. That's way too much information. I think that's assuming something else. The problem is, how do, we, how do we determine what it is? So why this particular topic? And why is it called this? About two years ago, I had the pleasure to present four one-hour workshops to the Saskatchewan Optometrist Assistance Conference. About a year before I went there, I was, co I was contracted to do four topics, thinking it would have been the CEOs and the leaders and the managers and supervisors. But when I actually got to the conference, it was the assistants. So the first topic was memory techniques and tips, which is great about how to remember things. Anybody ever have trouble remembering things? You know, it's a good, it, it's good, it's a good topic. The second one was how to get control of your day life and career, which is about time management. But my conclusion at the end of the second session was this wasn't the right information for them, for what their job was. So then I had two other presentations, <laughs> get out of my face conflict resolution. How many of you have difficult people in your lives? How many are sitting beside one right now but can't put your hand up? Okay, how many, how many were married to one? Okay, how many gave birth to one? Again, a great topic, but not applicable to their job and their position. And the last one was the power of trust in the workplace, which I think is probably one of the more important uh, topics these days, which ties into conflict resolution and toxic workplaces. So when I came back, I took the four, hours content, four hour content and made it one hour, which is what today's presentation is about, which is about how to create some results for you. So my conclusion from the uh, four one hour presentations was it was way too much information. So the challenge is how can you condense it down so people can actually walk away and do something with it? Well, it's uh, almost impossible to educate you to do something different when you walk out of here with the information my goal is to inspire you to do something with it after the presentation, assuming you can make the time to do that, which is always the issue. So that's where I want to go with that. So the outcomes that came out of the original presentation was how to provide a focus on how to master solutions needed to create personal growth and work expectations, how to be the best you can be at work and at home, uh, how to uh, develop a growth strategy. So where do you want to get to next? What is your short term? What are your long term plans? how to get a perspective on how to make the right decisions, which is really important. The right decision at the right time, having the right information, and how to understand the power, performance, agility, commitment, and goals. So as a result of hearing our other speaker last night, Jeff Kelly, one of the things I took away from him, he said, the goal, now he's talking about mentors, and I like to tie it into coaching, he says, is to develop people. Well, that's what this session is about, is about how to develop you and the people you work with. And so about, I'm, I'm, I'm multitasking here. We don't have this connected, so I got to try and do both at the same time. So what are the benefits to, how am I doing? So, thank you, so far. So the benefit is about how to, how to boost your confidence, because the better you feel about yourself, the more action you're going to take. It's how to enhance your decision-making process, which means about doing it now, the acting with urgency concept. It's about empowerment. You know, if you don't know what empowerment is, I like to say empowerment is about seeing the best in others helping them see themselves and holding them accountable to bring their best, which is probably what every one of you do all the time. 
anyways, but I like to say this is that check up for the neck up. You know, when things get tough about how to keep moving. So it's how to improve the workplace culture, uh, how to be valued and appreciated, that's what makes a huge difference. It's about how to inspire and motivate, and above all, it's about workplace balance and why that's so important. So, but like I say, the vision, and I think we heard it a couple of times last night, especially from Jeff, is the right job can transform a person's life, the right person can transform the business. And somewhere in between is what this session is all about. There are gonna be a number of slides. I'm not gonna read them to you. That's for you to download and look and do some action with after. So what came out of that, interesting enough, one of the first presentations I did after that Saskatchewan event was to a group of administrative professionals, administrative assistants, and the title was the Totally Organized Administrative Professionals All About Outcomes. The negative feedback I got at the end was somebody said to me, Bruce, your topic was how to become a CEO. I go, what's wrong with that? You know, if you're totally organized, why can't you rise? And I'm gonna give you a couple of examples about people who've done that. And that'd be the point behind that. This session is about this thing called mastery. So to be in master of your own domain, so it's how to be the best you can be, how to have control, it's about how to have authority, to be known for being the source of person, it's about having the upper hand, and above all, it's about competing against yourself, which I think is what we sometimes forget to do. Now, I, we all have good intentions. Has anybody ever said, I'm gonna do something, and then you didn't do it? Well, I had good intentions, but then something got in the way. Life, uh, that old song about uh, changing your guitar string, doing your hair. I like the quote that says, the difference between what we do and what we're capable of doing that suffice to solve most of the world's problems. What are our intentions? And what do we want to accomplish? You know, I think a lot of the messages behind what we're gonna hear last night and today is about how to become better at what you're doing. So my, because as I said, my job is to inspire you to do that. And one of the ways to make sure you do that is capture those good ideas. I like to say, you know, the, the so what behind the educational event is what are you can do with the idea? And that's why I say, you know, make sure you capture the, capture the good ideas and uh, write it down because as the statistic says, 97% of what you hear in any presentation will be forgotten within two weeks. My question to you is, how many of you would have trouble telling me a person you heard last year what their topic was and what you did with the information? And that's when you go, it was nice. But what do you do with it? And that's the real point. So that's what I want to do with you. So, I was walking by and a couple of people said, Bruce Lee. I've heard that name before. So how many when you saw Bruce Lee was speaking were thinking to yourself, how did they get Bruce Lee to speak? So how many have heard of the, heard of the other Bruce Lee? Now I get a lot of comments about that, so just so you know, unlike the other Bruce Lee, I was born in the Middle East. Winnipeg. Anybody else? You know, growing up in Winnipeg, I went to a school that was so tough. No one's been to a comedy club. So when you give that type of line, so one more time. So growing up in Winnipeg, I went to a school that was so tough. Well, this group gets it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. I remember growing up in Winnipeg, I went to a school. Uh, in a grade three, the schoolyard bully came up to me and she said, my dad can beat up your dad. And I said, fantastic, how much is that gonna cost? <laughs> I actually asked for group discount because my brothers were being real jerks. <laughs> so when people hear my name, because of how the brain works, they're compelled to ask a question about it. So when they hear Bruce Lee, they'll say, Bruce Lee, has anybody ever said anything about your name? And if I think they have a good sense of humor, I'll say, no, why? <laughs> and I'll say, actually, every second person. But for those that do know the other Bruce Lee, they'll say something like, um, thought you were dead. <laughs> and I'll say, rumors of my death have been greatly exaggerated. <laughs> Quoting Mark Twain, I would never say that myself. Or they say, if they know anything about the other Bruce Lee in Kung Fu, they'll say, do you know Kung Fu? Or, ah, so you know martial arts? And I go, no, but I have a brown belt. I'm wearing it today. <laughs> Or let's say something like, I've seen your movies, and I'll say, great, which one? So by the way, 
Burning My Heart and Wounded Knee was on last night. Anybody watch it when you got home? So I like, I like doing that, which is fine. So having said that, what is outcome? So I did a little acronym about what it's all about. So it's really, and I just want to, I want to make, it, make it easy to remember what it's all about. So the O is for optimistic. You know, the, the more, the better you make people feel, the greater the results they will create, and that includes you. You ever had some days where you just go in and you go, I don't want to be here, and it affects your work? So the question is, when it comes to uh, effective communication, we have a thing called perfectionists, and we have people who believe in excellence. Anybody ever worked with somebody who's a perfectionist? I'm guessing not a great environment. What are the people who believe in this thing called excellence? Those are the ones that inspire you, because they want to see what else you can do. They want you to bring new ideas. So the question is, well, how do people see you? And that's why that's so important. We want to make sure that you, they see you as being the person who's working for excellence. But it's all about this thing called attitude. How many of you have a good attitude today because you're here and you got your smartphone off? So everything, everything we do is based on our attitude about life. You know, we all have these great ideas, these great thoughts. These, the, we get inspired to do something and then we don't do anything about it until it's too late. So what the little acronym there is about is simply saying is we get this good thought, but if we don't feel good about it, we're not going to do anything. But if we can see the benefit to it, we'll take some action. And so when we have that action, we get the results, which creates more results. And that's really what, what that's about. So how do we get there? It's a thing called enthusiasm. How many of you are enthusiastic? Well, not bad. I'm going to test you in a minute here. <laughs> enthusiasm, the Greek word is enthusiasm, which means God possessed or God in you. And when the Greeks 2,000 years ago called you enthusiastic, it was the highest compliment they paid anybody. So when was the last time you were called enthusiastic? Because you're leaving the house. You got to come and play with your friends. So how many of you are enthusiastic at 4.30 Friday afternoon? Or are you enthusiastic at 7 o'clock Monday morning? Because that's the difference. Because when you're enthusiastic about your job, you, you get to make a difference in the lives of people. Isn't that what you do? Well, it's how you look at what your job function is. Sig Ziglar, the famous Texas motivational speaker, said people often say that motivation doesn't last well, neither is bathing, which is why we recommend it daily. So it's really about expecting the best and why it's so important. So how do we get there? Well, you want to focus on what you're doing, which is what this presentation is about. And you check your self-talk. 85% of our self-talk is negative, statistically speaking. Why we won't be successful, why we won't make the sale, why we won't make the timeline, why they won't say yes when I ask them for a date, why they won't say yes when I ask for the sale. How much of your self-talk is negative that affects what we do? Ah, what's the point? They're going to say no anyways. Or is it about believing in that outcome? So it's about being be aware of the self-limiting beliefs. The one example I want to give is, how many have trouble remembering names? Anybody here? So here's what probably happened. At some point in time, you're introduced to somebody, wasn't paying attention, or was a difficult, complicated, foreign name. And when you said the name, you got it wrong. They corrected you. You got embarrassed, and you said, I'm no good at remembering names. The problem is the brain hears that and says, that's your out. You never have to pay attention again. Because your excuse is, I don't remember names. That becomes your default. So how many do that now? We let that one excuse become our default. So you need to change the viewing behind that. There's some other good examples there. So one of the things that uh, I've done over the years is uh, I worked with a fellow named Muriel Kelly, and we'd do fire walks. And that's where you burn a whole bunch of wood and get these 1,200 red hot coals, and you take your shoes and socks off and your bare feet, you walk through 50 feet of red hot coals. How many have done that? You lived, good experience, nothing will stop you now, right? Great experience. But we'd also, at the end of the session, we'd also do these board breaking exercises where I'd hold up a one foot by one foot, three quarter inch piece of pine wood, and have people come up and just with the heel of their palm, break the board. So kind of like that example there. But the problem is so many people can't do it because they stop at the board. 
So this is Josh Klassen, who's a CTV Edmonton weatherman, who uh, added a, a conference we were both speaking at. Uh, when they asked for the volunteer, the entire audience said, have Josh do it. So isn't that great? So how many would like to do a board breaking exercise? Okay. Invite me back. How many would like to do that, that arrow breaking exercise? Or a fire walk exercise? How many would like to change your life forever? There's so many great activities to do there, and it gets rid of limiting beliefs. So we all have these limiting beliefs. So I just think that's great. That's when I decided to lose some weight too by, with that picture, by the way. So. So the power of the subconscious mind is what we think about that creates some results. How many have heard of Jim Carrey? Who hasn't heard of Jim Carrey? You know, the talking butt and everything else. But, you know, back in the, 19, the early 1990s, the this is a great example. When he was a struggling actor and comic, he'd moved from Toronto down to L.A. And he'd had some success in, in a TV show and, and, and some stand-up comedy. But every night after he finished his gig or his role, he'd drive out to the Hollywood Hills, get out of his car and shout at the top of his lungs, by 1995, I will earn $10 million a year. Every night. By 1995, I will earn $10 million a year. The reason for doing that is this thing called auditory reassurance. Because that tells you if it's real. In 1995, he filmed Ace Ventura When Nature Calls and was paid $20 million. Just overshot his goal a little bit. Our Jim Carrey was the highest paid actor in the world for talking to animals. How appropriate we're here today. How much do you want to earn? What is your goal? What is your auditory reassurance? That's the point. What's the next step? I heard one person ask the question, well, how do you get to be the CEO? Well, set that goal. Get that coach, get that mentor. So it's called affirmations. What are your affirmations? So the definition is it's a belief statement about a positive outcome, which gets rid of that 85% negative self-talk. So you have to have passion. A number of years ago, I was uh, emceeing, co-hosting, and speaking at a conference in uh, British Columbia. Sorry, back on up here. I was chairing a breakfast club here in Calgary, and we had Brett Wilson speak. How many know Brett Wilson? You know, depending on how he's introduced, he's either Canada's newest billionaire or most eligible bachelor. He spoke at the breakfast club three days after season three premiere of Dragon's Den tells this amazing story about how he went from literally being fired from the company he was at to being this hugely successful energy financial uh, juggernaut. And the message I picked up from him was about passion. We heard that word last night from Jeff, didn't we? So are you passionate? And passion can be seen as enthusiasm. It's similar. So what he said is, if you don't have passion, get out. Now, I will have people say to me, if you ever speak to our group, don't show this slide. Which means there's a problem with the culture. So the other concept is about investing in people, and he says, we can do more. Now, what you hear about him isn't his true story, but the real story is actually a fascinating story. So, how many of you love your job? How many of you, uh, how many of you, sorry, let me back up. How many of you like your job? Okay. How many love your job? How many do it just for the money? <laughs> that's okay. Yeah, because of the money. Yeah, that's fine. Confucius is reported to have said something like, love your job, you'll never work another day in your life. That's not what he really said, but it's become a popular expression. So what I like about it is, find a job you love and you had five days a week, because that's when you get to make that difference. Because that's when you're achieving your goals. That's when you get passionate about what you do. So what, what does it take to do to love your job? Different approach to it, understand where you're going, what the intent behind it is, uh, the accomplishments you want to make. So I want to show you, I want to show you about how to, how to create a good attitude. And it's something I like to share with every audience. All I need you to do is repeat after me what I say. Will you do that? So everybody say, it's up there. I look good. I look good. 
Not bad. Now, with a little more enthusiasm, say, I feel great. Good, now turn to one person beside you and say to them, you are so lucky you're sitting with me here today. <laughs> and there's always somebody who goes, you really are lucky you're sitting with me. And then some people go, I'm lucky I am sitting with you. So it's what you make of that experience. So. The you, is about, the you is about urgency, and there's that word passion again. So getting it done now. I put down there, do important things ever not get done, it's because we don't understand how to get it done, what the urgency behind it is, why that's so important. So the concept is, you know, managers light a fire under people, but leaders light a fire in people. And that's where your passion, your enthusiasm, your excitement, your coaching, mentoring comes in. When you get people to want to do things to help, become there. So how many of you had somebody light that fire in you? you know, one of the last ideas I want to share with you is about how to make that happen with other people. Because that's when you really see an advance in how people get, get things going. So it's really about action. So what are you going to start doing? What are you going to stop doing? What can you do better? How can you improve upon what you're doing? What can you recommend to others? You know, share those good ideas. As Charles Dickens said, when you find and make a note of it, well, then act on it. Why that's so important. You know, Larry Wingett, who's one of the most successful sales coaches around, says uh, business improves when we get better. Yeah, that's kind of one of those blinding flashes, the obvious, but how do we get better? So it says, you know, so I, so I kind of condensed a lot of what he said. He says, you know, are you asking, what did I, what did we do to make my company more sales, profitable, cut expenses? That's what you're about, isn't it? Isn't that what you should be about? What efficiencies and strategies can I now take advantage of? That's your focus. How can I do more with less? We all need to do that. So where are we sourcing these, these, these opportunities to, to do more with less, cut our costs, which means improve our profitability? You know, every dollar, every dollar we, we cut in cost could be the same as not having to make $5 in sales. Well, there seems to be a really good advantage behind you want to do that. So how can I open new markets? How can I increase margins? How can I make my customers more successful? That's what you're about. Is that a great way to look at it? How do I make my customers more successful? That should be the mantra in the morning. How do I make a difference for them? Why, that, why that's so important. So the question is, well, how successful are you ready to be? The concept, I do change management, it says, <laughs> best way to predict the future is to create it. Well. A SWOT analysis is not a bad idea. How many of you do SWOT analysis now? Good. Isn't that frightening? Because there's so many opportunities and so little time to do them. You know, when I do strategic planning with organizations, we do a SWOT analysis, they go, where do we start? Because they go, this is great, but who knows how to get there? A SWOT analysis is just a very small starting point for changing the direction of your company and you. Do it on you. So that's where this comes from. Uh, I'm not sure who said it, but I like this quote. Somebody said that when you put your attention on your intentions, miracles happen. And that's true. So what is our attention? What is our focus? Uh, Harv Ecker, some of you may have heard of him. He said, how you do anything is how you do everything. That is a slam. That is a negative comment. Because what it's saying is you're not, you're not stepping up your potential. Again, last night on TV, Jim Carrey, the yes man. That would be the perfect example. He kept saying no, but when he started, when he started saying yes, his life changed. It's a movie. But it's true. How many have seen the yes man? Isn't that cute? How many watched it last night? Okay, because you're busy getting ready for today. That's okay. So, so, so the success, success question is, what did, you, what did you do that created the most success? Now duplicate it. Chances are is when you got really passionate about something. Not because you're told to do it, because you want to do it. So what can you get passionate about? Uh, and one way to accomplish it if you're having trouble is an accountability agreement. So how many of you are familiar with accountability agreements? 
Okay, how many have had an accountability agreement on you personally? Okay, well, good experience, bad experience, good experience. I think they can be great because literally it's a license for you to do what has to be done. If you want to see one, I can send you one, I'll give an example of one. When I had one, that's when our company moved gangbusters. Because other little things didn't get in the way. So that's one way to, to create that success. So the T and outcomes is about trust. Are you trustworthy? And how do you know? Is your company trustworthy? Well, sure it is. And you are because you're here. But trust is an important issue when it comes to anything. So it's, trust is what it takes to build and sustain your reputation and your competitive advantage. I like to say it's the key that opens doors. When people trust you by what you say. So does it matter? Well, sure it matters. How we get there is by having a great place to work. It's about our culture. So it's being known for, for credible product and services and reputations and warranties, guarantees, uh, safety, as the speaker this morning said. It's about fairness, how we treat people, how we treat problems. It's about respect for people, regardless of age, color, sex, religion, uh, affiliations, pride in what we do. You know, uh, we did one training program a little while ago, and we actually had the company pr produce a little pin that said pride. And people say, what is it? Well, pride in my company. I, I love working here. So it's about growth, camaraderie, major product and services, quality, quality resources, and most of all, it's this thing called trust why it's so important. So business benefits the trust. They're there, I don't need to go over them with you. If you get, the, if you get download it, it just means you're gonna advance better. Personal benefits the trust, it's important for you. Let's do that again. So better reputation, better references, less stress, faster career development. Uh, it's important. The problem is, let's do it this way. The problem is lack of trust. Uh, the expression is people leave bosses. How many of you have ever left an organization because of your boss? We could use the word hypocrite, narcissist, antisocial. So how many left because of a boss? Okay, and how many left because of a supervisor? Okay. Depending on some organization I talk to, I've seen 80% of the hands go up. I've done that. I've left because of a boss. So how many of you are bosses? You know, did you know boss, spelled backwards, is double S-O-B? I think most of you got that. All right, so that's why these supervisory skills are so important. Uh, Robert Half International, a number of years ago, did a survey that said the number one reason people leave is lack of recognition and praise. The latest survey says it's because of lack of promotional opportunities or benefit packages appropriate to them. It matters. Well, the first one's kind of important, recognition and praise. How important is that? How many have children? How important is recognition about what they do? It's how they grow, it's how they mature, it's how they develop. How, is important, how important is it to you in the workplace? It's how you grow and develop because you're supported and championed. Why it's so important. So, uh, FYI, I have a book out on trust. If you want it, just ask for it. In Stephen, in St Stephen Covey Sr.'s book um, on leadership skills, he talks about what it takes, where, where, uh, where trust comes from. And he's talking about, so it's, it starts with you. So if you're trustworthy, it extends out to your department, to your company, to your community reputation, why, why it's so important. And that's just one, one FYI behind that. Uh, I think this is still on his website, but if you want to know if you're trustworthy, on the Stephen Covey Speed of Trust website, you can do two personal credibility questionnaires to see if you're trustworthy or not. So what's the benefit of trust? I go energy, because people do things. Attitude, because they get, they get that they can do what they want to do. It's about speed, because they bring their best. It's about uh, productivity, which means profitability, all important. So it becomes an important, important point behind that. Uh, so it's about constant communication. We talked about that last night. And again, I'm not going to read these slides to you. This is if you want to download it, it's the talking points for you. The C in outcomes is about, do that again, is about conflict resolution, which is why I asked you if you have difficult people. So it's about winning over difficult people, eliminating gossip, harassment, stress. That means if you want to have a great culture, you've got to make sure that doesn't happen. Interestingly enough, the most popular topic I do as a webinar or on site is, how about, is the manager's guide to detoxing a negative workplace. I am shocked it's still that popular topic. Why? Well, 
it's because management or supervisors don't get the impact it has. If you don't like who you're working with or working for, why would you contribute your best? Now, it creates stress. I don't need any more stress, thank you very much. How many want more stress? Sorry, how many want more stress? Sorry, how many want a promotion? Nobody? Okay, how many want a promotion? Want more pay? More stress? <laughs> Unless you have the attitude to control it. Because theoretically people go, well, I don't want to do that because, and they'll give all the negative reasons behind it. Or you go, well, maybe that's why I should do that. So the question is, when it came to that boss, am I the problem or am I the solution to the problem? Well, hopefully you're the solution to the problem. The challenge is workplace conflict lowers productivity. The Taylor research said that 70% of an organization's value is based on the skills, activities, and performance. But if you have conflicted workplace culture, you're not going to be your best. Which is when you think about leaving. And when you think about leaving, you don't bring your best ideas. And you take that long lunch break. Find excuses to be sick. So what causes difficult people besides <laughs> you <laughs> and unreasonable expectations? Too much work, too much going on. Well, it's either two things. It's either stress or jealousy. You know, I like to say, you know, what causes it is, is somebody's trying to level the playing field. If you look at the real cause behind it. They want something they don't have. They think they should have. Or it's lack of flexibility, which means not being able to communicate the issues importantly behind that. But what do you, so what do you have to do about it? Well, there's, there's two sources of, con of difficult people. Number one is performance, which is people not doing what you want them to do. I'm like say, you know, difficult people are people who do what you don't want to do, do what you don't, do what you don't want to do, don't do what you want to do, and you don't know what to do. Does that sound about right? I said that fast. Difficult people, the ones that create trust, are the ones who don't do what you want them to do. Wouldn't that get you mad? I told you. Or they do what you don't want them to do. Why'd you do that? Or you go, how am I going to cope with this idiot? Right? That's why it's, why it's so important. The second cause behind it is about there's no relationship. Their interpersonal skills suck. So they don't have it. Anybody work for somebody like that? Worked. <laughs> Operative word here. Yeah, so it's about all these soft skills that are important that gets in the way. So if you do have that, if you do have that difficult situation, what do you have to do about it? Something. <laughs> because silence means consent. If you don't say anything about it, that means it's okay. Isn't it? So the longer you let it go, the more it becomes part of the culture of the organization. That's why that's so important. So two concepts I'd like to talk about when it comes to difficult people. You probably do this anyways, and I see a lot of this you've heard before, is to take some of those personal assessment courses, those self-tests. One is called the personal interests, attitudes, and values. How many have done that one? It tells you if you're in the right job. And then DISC, and we heard the two speakers last night talk about DISC. If you've taken any of that training, it shows you where you have that conflict and why that's so important. So DISC, good course, is it. The O in outcomes is about goals. How many have good goals? I'm going to get through today. See what brings next. So how are you doing on your goals? Now, I remember before the last financial recession, people really looked forward to looking at their, their statements from their RSPs. And that changed for a while. Goals change. Napoleon Hill. Napoleon Hill said, cherish your visions and your dreams as they're the children of your soul, the blueprints of your ultimate, ultimate achievements. Well, what does that mean? Uh, I have a friend by the name of Mark Victor Hansen. Some of you may know him. He says, big goals, big results. No goals, no results, or somebody else's goals. Whose goal should you be working on? Yours or somebody else's? First of all, yours, but your role as a manager or supervisor is make sure that your employees, your subordinates' roles, goals are the same as the company's and are in sync with their goals. 
Because the better they do, the better you do, the better the company does, the better the department does. But what are the goals? Well, a paycheck isn't the right answer. It's about where you want to go to next. So it's about having directional strategies, which is basically what I just told you. But it's, like, it's focusing on what do I want to do today and how did I do today? So how do you track, how do you measure, and why that's, and why that's so important? The other uh, dragon I had some time with was Arlene Dickinson. This is at that conference in British Columbia a number of years ago where she's speaking to a room full of female entrepreneurs. And if you know her story from being an unemployed mother of four when she started working at Venture Communications to all of a sudden being, to being the CEO of a company that's hugely successful with 200 employees, who at one point in time fired half her staff to be, to be successful, that's a great story. Her message to the audience was, keep dreaming big and pushing ahead. Take, a, take as big a leap as you can. Which means those huge, humongous goals. Uh, I like to tie it into Ginny Dye, said, the choice I make today will determine the rest of my life. It's about the choices we make every single day and why that's so important. I love this slide. You're only one decision away from a totally different life. Isn't that true? You're either going to say yes or you're going to say no. As a supervisor, we're always giving our people choices to make, to do something, not do something. We're always helping people to find which road to take. And with right information, right coaching, right support, they're going to take the right road. How many of you have people who helped you take the right road? You haven't looked back? I heard a couple of examples last night. So a friend of mine, the one I used to do the firewalks with, Real Kelly, has a book all called Life Sinks of Sores, A Choice is Yours. I'm not going to tell you what it's about, but what I want to say is the reason, his conclusion is the reason we're not as successful as we can be is we always defer to the easy choice, not the hard choice. We don't ask why, and we look at the short term, not the long term, and why that's so important. We always do what's most important to us in the moment as compared to what we should be doing over the short term or long term. And I really like this quote to support that from Stephen Covey. He says, I'm not a product of my circumstances. I'm a product of my decisions. So it's not about the, bl the, bl the blame game. It's about being accountable. Totally accountable for what happens for you. So we heard Jeff Kelly talk about last night about as, as mentors, we're here to develop people. I think that's more or less what he said. One of the resources I make available on the evaluation form on your table, if you want any of the resources, they're free. They're either, you can either ask me for them on the evaluation form or they're on my website, is how to coach and be coached, which is this one here, the coaching skills self-assessment. Great resource. So it can be, it can be a, 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 a self-assessed coaching. How are, you, how are you doing when it comes to people uh, or how you want to deal with people? The M in outcomes is about uh, how do we measure what we're doing, so how are we doing, so do you measure and compare. Uh, it says up to 37% of employees' activities are not aligned with the overall business strategy. That's an important statistic. So are you doing the right thing at the right time? I remember long, uh, a number of years ago, I was asked to do a study with these, these marketing people for one company, but they wanted to get a raise. And I said, okay, all I need you to do for one week is fill out this little form every 15 minutes about what you do during the day so I can find out if you're actually working on sales and marketing or administration. And the one person said, I don't have time to fill out that form. I said, ah, I'm sorry, I don't have time to give you a raise. We're talking five minutes worth of work. Because then it'll determine what you actually do with your day. Where do you waste time? Where do you spend time? Where do you do things you shouldn't be doing? So do you measure what you do? How are we doing on results? That's why it's so important. Well, we need to. So it's about, it's about being the best you can be. Are you? How do you know? How are you staying on track? It's about doing the things you can't control and the things you can, which is why you need to measure what you're doing. And at the end of the day, you ask yourself, what ideas, skills, improvements, or systems that I learned today that will make me more efficient in serving others tomorrow? A great way of looking at how can you be more productive about being that pocket of excellence. So how many have heard about the book, the movie, The Secret? How many have spent time checking out The Secret? Do you know what The Secret is? 
think good things and your life changes. Is that true? There's only one thing wrong with that. The action component. You can think about good things all you want, but you've got to do something different. Yeah, so think good things and things will change if you act on it. Uh, in 1957, a book came out by Earl Nightingale called The Strangest Secret. I doubt you've read it. At the time it came out, it, was, it came out as an album, like on the table there, some of you have on the table. Sold a million copies. It became the biggest selling album, spoken album ever. But he said the strangest secret is that people who were successful knew where they wanted to be and took action which is what I'm sharing with you. So we all have good ideas, we all feel good about it, but do we take action on it? So the reason he said it's the strangest secret is because it's been around for 2,000 years. It's in the Bible. Seek and you shall find. Anybody know the rest of that? Act and it shall happen, there's a third, there's a third part. I know when I'm alone in my hotel room, I look at the Bible from time to time, and I'll read that just to be inspired <laughs> if I can find it. So we need to have goals, and I think probably everyone here is familiar with SMART goals. You know, who hasn't heard about SMART goals? But it's really about making sure if you can measure it, you can accomplish it. So let me do it this way. How many have ever said, I need to lose some weight and didn't lose weight? So you saw that one picture where I had that little beer belly. So a number of years ago, uh, I decided to lose some weight. So I said, by, I want to lose 25 pounds within a certain time frame, so I created a chart. And then every day you weigh, your, you weigh yourself, what's the advantage to measuring every day your goal? You can see progress or not. So if you see progress, you go, I'm doing good. And all of a sudden the weight goes up, you go, I better watch it today. Isn't that common sense? So when it comes to something as simple as, as losing weight. Now the good news is, when I lost the 25 pounds, on the exact date I wanted to, everybody said, boy, you look good. No thanks. So it went to self-esteem, which is confidence. But you set the goal. So the second chart there is I decided I need to lose another 25 pounds last year. And look at the goal. When you see a chart goes like that, you go, I'm doing the right thing. So what do you measure? I remember when I took my flying lessons when I just graduated from university, I started tracking uh, hours in the air and dollars. So I knew when I got to a certain point, I'd have my, my pilot's license. And the higher they got, I go, I'm so close to my goal. So what do you track? Anything? What should you track? I, I can say a lot of things. And it can become simple, but it can really can be kind of a motivational component behind you. How do we get there? Well, it's about implementation. And one of the things I, I always like to say is, I love speaking to great organizations, but I want to make sure people actually get a, go away with some good ideas. I asked you earlier on how many have been to an event before and have done little with the information. How many, how, be honest, how many have actually done that? By the way, I love, asking, I love asking this question. If I'm doing the toxic workshop, I'll go, how many people have lied so far today? <laughs> so let me give you an example. How many have lied so far today? Okay. You're all lying. <laughs> I guarantee every one of you has lied at least once today. You think about what you say, because we lie to make people feel good or protect ourselves. Interesting observation. Point I want to make when it comes to this is we need to measure what we're doing. When somebody goes to an educational workshop or attends a webinar, goes to a conference, goes to a great event like this, when they, go, when they come back, somebody might say, the person who sent them might say, how was the course? And the response would be, room was cold, travel was bad, speaker was boring, heard it before, food was awful. That wasn't the question. <laughs> what the question should be is, what did, you, what did you learn? And that means when you go to any event, you come back with what you went there to learn. Who was the keynote? Who was the breakout session? 
Did you meet them? Did you get their workbooks? Did you get their book if they had one? Did you actually become their friend? Did you actually come back, come back with some information you're going to do something with? And the real question is, uh, what, did we, what did you learn? How can we, the company, help you implement the results? What you learned. That's where you get the real learning. So you move from a reaction to learning to behavior to results. That's why there's that little tape measure that's so important behind that. What are you going to do with the information? Well, I'd like to talk about that. The E in outcomes is about excellence. Uh, and how I want to start wrapping this up is it's about, it's about the traits and self-tests that drive you to being the best you can be. And how do we know we're there? So measure your personality, reputation, performance. So uh, who or what do you see as being excellent and what they, do, what they do or are? So how do you compare others to being the best they can be? Is what it really is. And what are the traits they admire? Because if you admire something in somebody else, that means you probably like it in you. If there's something you don't like in somebody, it's probably something you don't like in you. That's a way of looking at it. When it comes to the definition of what excellence is, it's from the Latin definition of meaning rising out of the potential. So what is your potential? It's about being the best you can be. You know, I, I find it interesting. Aristotle, 2,000 years ago, said, you are what you repeatedly do. Excellence is not an event. It is a habit. And I go, he said that 2,000 years ago? What a smart man. This is what we consistently do to drive the results. So it's about being the best you can be. Debbie Fields, she's been in the news a little bit past a little while, founder of Mrs. Fields Cookies. The quote I like from her, she says, good enough never is. So whenever she would hear herself going, that's good enough, she'd add never is. Because what that means is mediocrity. It mean about being average, about being less than the best you can be. So whenever you go, oh, that's good enough, what are you really saying? Maybe you could do better. So when it comes to anything you present, if you ever, ever hear yourself going good enough, maybe you go, maybe I should just take another look at it. Look for the typos, reorganize the content, put in some slides, put in some uh, different material, highlight things, bold things, get a second opinion on it. When you hand it in, you're going, this is the best it can be. Ah, oh, good enough. That's good enough for government workers. No, it's not. So this is that little mental uh, attitude we, ha we all have about it, why it's so important. So, how to become the boss everybody wants to work for? Do you know what people think of you? How many of you like to know what your co-workers think of you? I'll go back, to, back it up. How many of you like to know what everybody thinks of you? How many like to know? So there's two ways of doing it. We can either have everybody come up here one at a time and everybody say what they like about them. Okay. How many like to have people measure and report to you what they think of you? How many like to have that happen? Now, I don't, I don't get a lot of hands up because people go, might be bad. I'm on, I might not like what I hear. You know, there's that conflict. There's that holding back. So two resources I have for you that are a really great way of doing it is they're called self-tests. So what they are, the first one is rating your, rating your soft skill leadership attributes are the attributes, what's your behaviors that the statistics survey say matter most to people about how you are as a leader. And what do you do with this one? Before you give it to anybody, do it yourself. Fill it out. How do I see me? And then do another one and say, how do I think my people see me? Then you give this blank ones to either your coworkers, uh, supervisor, boss, customers, and say, can you spend five minutes to be honest? Give me some honest feedback. How do you see me? Because I know I need to improve in some areas. I'd like to know what they are. I got to tell you, the first time I did this, I was nervous. Whew, thank goodness you like me. But there were some deficiencies, and I changed. One deficiency was, she said, you never smile. I go, you're right. I'm thinking too much about work. And it changed the relationship. I had a little bit more fun. It was a new startup. So would you like to know what people think about you? This can be interesting. But look what's being measured. Enthusiastic, persistent, determined, positive thinker, smile, say hello, helpful, go out of your way. Sincere. Care, appearance, initiative, consistent, punctual. Are those important? They're important to your reputation 
and to your productivity. But if they're seeing something negative that matters to them in those categories, they're going to change how they see you and how they perform to you or you to them. The second one is a confidential one, sealed envelope. When I work with my brother's company and we go work with new hospitals, clients, we'll have every single person fill us out on their direct boss. And that will tell the CEO where they have the problem within the organization, where they need to do the training or to let the manager go. But again, look what's being measured. These are a matter, these are important. Respect, communication, alignment, trust, recognition, feedback, empowerment, insider information, coach, champion, training, tools, leadership, and friendship, empathy. P.S. I really look forward to coming to work. All are important. How would you rate your department, your coworkers? Even if you don't do these self-tests, just focus on one or two of the attributes a week and people will see you acting different. You will see a new you and the ones that are important to you. We need to focus on where the, where the deficiencies are. Why that's so important. And again, ask for them, they're on my website, they're free for that. And then the, uh, the S in outcomes is about success by Sam. Sam's a nice little acronym I've come up with about how to motivate, inspire, uh, support people. So do you Sam enough? What a silly question. So what, where that's going is, it's about how to inspire people by career building talents, top characteristics, uh, and it's about showing people how to do the job. John D. Rockefeller many years ago said, good leadership, good leadership consists of showing average people how to do the work of superior people. Yeah, that's how we get trained, that's how we train people. I remember when I first started my first job, I got trained by some pretty good people who have been there for years and eventually I came back as their boss. That's kind of cool. Started off as a new hire, the trainee, and came back as their boss five years later. Respected what they taught me. Because they taught, they trained me well. All a new hire needs to know is everything you know. And the sooner the better. Because then they can get up to speed and become more productive. Which means more profitable, better relationships, more trust. It all matters. And leaders are in short supply. We saw that statistic last night. You know, if you're new to this industry, you've got a fantastic career ahead of you. Did anybody be excited seeing that? That statistic about the 9.2 million, the 2.9 million, and the 7.9 million. Anybody excited about what that meant to you? I would get excited based on that. I would get people into this industry. That's what I talked to my wife about. Pretty interesting statistic. It's what you take out of that statistic. It's what you act on. One of my favorite, uh, hard to understand speakers, um, Peter Drucker, as in one uh, presentation with him one time, he said, leadership is lifting a person's vision to higher sights, the raising of a person's performance to a higher standard, the building of a personality beyond its normal limitations. That's what I do. That should be what you do if you are a manager, supervisor, or leader, boss. How do we do that? We focus on strengths, make high demands based on it. Jeff talked about that last night. Put people into higher decision-making opportunities. If they don't have the skills, put them in a new task where they can learn the skill. Then become better get the experience from the group that they wouldn't otherwise get. You know, give them that chance to shine. Review their performance and create workplace conditions where they can live up to it. So how do we get that? Three cores you need to be good at. Customer service, time management, conflict resolution. You all need to be good at those. You want to be successful as you want. So here's what Sam is. Three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes. I go as long as I want. Thank you. Brindis and I actually go back to a political campaign, which is kind of cool and very successful, so we're happy about that. You like that picture? Isn't that cute? So while the cat will never become the lion, there's an interesting message here. It's when you look in the mirror, what do you see? Do you go, oh man, I gotta work with the animals today. Or do you go, it's pretty good. <laughs> the question is when you look your people in the eye, what do you see? People who care what they do, are committed to the organization, are excited about the potential, get they make a difference, or have to be told every day what to do and how to do it. So that comes from your leadership, your coaching, your mentoring, your, your skills. Mostly soft skills. 
as I think Jeff said last night, the expression I like to say is, people get hired for their hard skills, lose their job because lack of soft skills. That's my version of what he said last night. That's why that's important. We can have the knowledge, but do we have the interpersonal skills to be successful? Why that's so important. So what is Sam? I'm gonna do this real quick. Sam is about setting high expectations. That's what it's all about. The higher the expectation, the greater the resource, the greater the results. Higher achievement always comes from high expectation. We need to make sure people have the resources and tools to do that. Sorry, I'll get this done yet. Second thing is about appreciation. How many of you get enough compliments, recognition, and acknowledgement for the great job you do? You go, ah, it's okay, I got enough of that. You don't have to thank me. Or do you ever go, why aren't you thanking me? I worked real hard on this. Do you see where I'm going with this? We grow up from acknowledgement about what we do. If you have little kids, <laughs> great job. Oh, that's fabulous, Robert. Then what happened? And you go, you know, Robert, you hurt yourself. You know, it's your own fault. Fundamentally, you should have known that if you rode that bike like that. <laughs> no, people want to be acknowledged for what they do. We, uh, we grow up. We, we, we respond to accolades and compliments. Mary Kay Ash, anybody use any of her products? My favorite quote from her says, pretend every single person you meet has a sign around the neck that says, make me feel important. Not only, will you, not only will you succeed in sales, you will succeed in life. Just make people feel important. How do you do that? You talk to them about them. You help them set goals. You help them become the best they can be. You listen, you act on it, you give them resources. And about making a difference, if you want to have a profound impact on somebody, believe in them more than they believe in themselves. How many of you have had that, how, how many of you have had that happen where somebody believed in you more than you believed in you? You know, if we had more time, I'd say, I want to hear the stories. In my book, there's some pretty good stories about that. But if you want to make, if you want to stand, when you advance the most, when somebody said you can do it, and you step up to the challenge, that's the point. Because people go, no, can't do that. But when you convince them to say yes, that's when they're going to change, and that's when you're going to see that growth in them or you. Because probably your greatest success came when you said, I'm going to do that. Well, where does that come from? Well, it's about setting the goal. Johann Wolfgang van Gogh, I, I put some brackets around the quote because at the time when he said it, it was male-centric, so I'm going to read it the way it is now. For a person to achieve all that is demanded of them, they must regard themselves as greater than they are. So how do we see ourselves? Because that's that self-esteem, that's that self-actualization, that's that motivational component. How do you see you when you look in the mirror? When you look your people in the eye, what do you see? Why oh, that's so important. So some great questions there about what that is. So I'm going to quote the other, I'm going to quote the other Bruce Lee. Kind of looks like me in the morning too. It says, knowing is not enough, we must apply. Willing is not enough, we must do. So good information, but what, what are you going to do? What are you going to act on it? So congratulations. Two thoughts to get you started. I like to go into the kind of why you're here. It says your network creates your future net worth. I like that concept. And the size of your thinking determines the size of your results. How big are you going to think? Tomorrow. But making notes today, what you want to do. Sir Edmund Hillary said people do not decide to become extraordinary, they decide to accomplish extraordinary things. So let's talk about Terry Fox, Steve Fagno, Rick Hansen. They are all told no. You can't do that. They decided to do it. Huge issues. Did they make a difference? They've changed everybody's life. So what's the challenge you're going to take on? To do the extraordinary thing with and for your family. So the concept is, live every day as if you're last and everyone, you'll never know when you're going to be right. Doesn't mean live as if you're going to die tomorrow. However, we never know. This means 
Get the most out of your day. You know, make the right decisions. Do it, just start those. You know, remember that movie, What About Bob? What was the concept for Bill Murray creating success? He did little tiny baby steps, right? I was hiking up a mountain with my kids seven years ago, and there's this really older, overweight guy, and he's going up, he's, go, he's going along a path like this. And we were, we were walking real fast, and I, every once in a while I said to my kids, just, just wait, just wait, just wait. So as fast as we went, this guy was just going like this. Guess who got to the top first? It was a tie. He, ex he expended no energy. We worked ourselves to the sweat. Little tiny baby steps, which means just start. Try something new, you're gonna get there. So uh, I like to say, what's the best idea you got today? Well, maybe it's called the first hour back. Two books I like to recommend about achieving amazing outcomes. Lee Iacocca, Where Have All the Leaders Gone? If you haven't read the book, I encourage you to read it. It's simple to read. He could have been president. He changed how people buy cars with one concept. And the reason is because his boss said, I am being transferred, I want you with me. You gotta read this book. Second one is Abraham Lincoln. Talk about one person's will changing the outcome of the war. Just think about what happened if it had been a tie. We wouldn't be here. Interesting book. So it's about to get you thinking. So as has been said, life is too short to spend it doing things you don't want to do, so what are you going to do? Uh, improve ideas to improve your performance, others' performance, job satisfaction, customer satisfaction, what's so important. So the concept is once you stop learning, you start dying. I know Einstein was a little heavy on that, of course, but I think it's about keep educating yourself. So with that, when you start implementing some of the ideas, when you believe in yourself, when you talk about, when you implement some of the ideas, your individual productivity can go up by up to 40%. When people know that what they do matters, regardless of their position, that makes that a huge difference. So with that, I want you to repeat after me to say, I look good. I, everybody say, I look good. A <laughs> little more enthusiasm. I feel, I feel great. Turn to one person beside you and say to them, I am so lucky to be sitting beside you today. And with that, thank you very much, Brindis. I think I'm at my time. <laughs>